Uh, welcome to PSA and today about flexible rises. As uh, Trom said, uh, we'll go through a bit about our uh, area of responsibilities, the main priorities, a bit specific on the follow-up on flexible rises and pipelines, look into the trends of risk levels, and uh, just so you know it, the regulatory requirements and a short summary. This map shows our area of responsibility, and it includes more than 70 fixed installations, 50 rigs, more than 15,000 kilometers pipe, around 300 flexible dynamic rises, and around 300 flexible static pipelines. PSA is the regulator for technical and operational safety and it includes and we cover all the phases of the petroleum activity. Uh, we follow up through our uh, supervisionary activity, and I will come back to that uh, a bit later. Our main priorities um, for 2014 will actually be published later today but uh, you might recognize a few of them from before. The three last one is the same, but of course will be touched on in a bit different and more specific areas for next year. But um, starting at the top, the far north is a new one. We see that the activity goes far further north and we need to look into those areas to understand and better and to reduce the risks. With the barriers, um, the safety barriers must be maintained in order to minimize the risks. And to know your barriers is crucial to do so. Um, the uh, groups of exposed risk, you know that the uh, risk is not equally uh, disturbed. So it's uh, a need to understand and um, put into measures to reduce the risk for those groups. And what the management uh, put up as their priorities is uh, important as well. Uh, we know that um, when the management uh, ask for major accident risks indicators, it happens thing in that area also. So as I said, the main priorities will be for, for, for next year will be published later today with a bit more uh, information also. What we are doing towards the industry in this area of flexible rises, we have status, annual status meeting with operators that have flexible pipelines and rises. And Statel is the major player here. Almost 60% of their production goes through a flexible pipeline or riser. And Statel is stretching and developing technology. We also make annual summary uh, of trends in the risk level, the RNNP. And there we look, for example, at leaks and damages to risers, pipelines, and subsea facilities. We perform audits and verification, and within this topic we talk about today, we find observation related to training and competency, to lack of documentation, and also uh, issues within the integrity management. So all those areas is a need to, to focus on. And in several years, we have produced industry reports for learning and sharing of experiences. Um, I hope you all know the flexible pipeline report from 2007. Um, and we also had uh, reports on robust um, material selection and on aging and lifetime extensions. And we hold seminar like today for learning and sharing. We also represented in standardization groups something that you will hear on later uh, today by, by Trom. Looking into uh, the major incidents, the picture doesn't look very good. 
We have had 71 major incidents uh, with flexible rises reported to PSA from 2000 and to 2012. And this is uh, collected from our incident database and the CODEM database. The number is far too high. Major incident trends is linked to a few design solutions and a few facilities. And there is about 80 to 100 rises that has been changed out the last 15 to 20 years. And this requires quite a lot of resources, both money and people. <coughs> and it's really good that it hasn't been any loss of life, but you all know the potential is there. So I hope you all know the requirements within this area, but it's just to have you all to remember the rules are there to be followed. And I want to point out a few of those. Section 57 in the facility regulations says that if you select a pipeline of other material than steel, you have to have the same or even higher safety level for those pipelines compared with the steel pipelines. And section 10 states out a few very important features like having a robust and simple design, having uh, or, and, and reducing the possibility for uh, human error. Uh, it has to be operated, tested and maintained without a risk for personnel. And of course, it needs to withstand the loads uh, that uh, pipelines can be exposed to. So, lastly, uh, a short summary of areas of improvement. There is a need to update the standards for the most, uh, to include the most recent experience. And within the integrity management, it's a need to manage this, to include the continuous monitoring and system for documenting operation history. And of course, to ensure good training and expertise, to have the risk reduced and to get the good understanding. The industry must also actively commit to research and development in order to increase knowledge of flexible prices and share the information. In short, share and learn, reduce the risk, understand the risk, so it's possible to reduce it and also to reduce the uncertainties. And as I said, follow up the barriers. You have to know the barriers and you have to keep them healthy. I think you take that one later. So with that, um, I wish you all a good day and I hope uh, you share and learn today as well. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions to uh, the start of our introduction? It should be all known to them. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, then I'll continue a little bit myself. Uh, we. Uh, we have we had a session at the DNV a couple of weeks ago uh, where we discussed where are we going when it comes to flexibles, uh, where do we go from here, how do we improve the integrity. Uh, our role as uh, uh, the regulator for health, safety, and environment in the, in the petroleum industry is not to tell uh, the industry how how it should be done, but I would like to point out here uh, that. Uh, this is from the standardization groups. We have the NORSOC standards. We refer to some NORSOC standards. We also refer to ISO standards. When it comes to flexible risers, we refer to the API 17J. Uh, what we have when it comes to subsea standardization in Norway is 
uh, an expert group that follow, follows up uh, these standards in Norway. It's the standard in the ISO 13628 series, one to nine, uh, and some other working projects. They are in the EG expert group U, sub C, and the flexible uh, pipe system ISO 13628-2, same as the API 17J, is also there. But it's not treated there because this is mainly for subsea systems and it also belongs to another subcommittee in the ISO system. So it's, it's a bit treat, it falls between two chairs there. For the pipelines, we have the expert group Y, which covers the uh, ISO 13623 and the I0, Y002 life extension for transportation systems. In here, there is uh, flexible uh, pipelines mentioned as well, but it's mainly focused on rigid steel pipelines. We have a life extension standard in subsea as well, NORSOC U009, which covers subsea systems. Uh, these are only some uh, previous, uh, it's, it's work programs and some uh, withdrawn standards. This is to show from the uh, Norwegian oil and gas uh, life extension uh, document that they uh, provided a, year, a few years ago with uh, substandards. And here you see in everything in green was decided to put in the subsea standard, the U0091. Uh, everything in red was decided to put in the pipeline standard, Y002. So the flexibles are actually part of the pipeline life extension standards. What's a little bit odd here is that parts of the flexibles is a part of the subsea standards. For instance, the flotation elements, uh, the midwater arches, uh, which, which you, we all here would consider a part of the configuration. Uh, so, and this is how it is in, in, in the North Oak, you have the the guideline on top, then you have for pipelines, for subsea systems, uh, flexibles are mentioned in here, but it's not treated in detail. So without uh, saying how it should be, we just say that subsea systems are treated quite well in the expert groups in North Oak. Pipelines are treated quite well flexible risers falls a little bit in between. We don't say that there should be another group or a subgroup or something, but it might be something for the industry to consider because it's a, an industry responsibility. Uh, so if there are any comments uh, or questions, uh, there is time for that now. We can have that later as well. If not, we will uh, continue with uh, the next uh, presenter. Okay, Krasi, if you can state your name and company. Krasi Dorn of Excel Mobile Development Company. My question, Trond, is when you have a conflicting standard requirements between RSOC API, uh, North Sock API and ISO, how do you deal with that? Uh, I know there are uh, some conflicts, for instance, in the in the U standards where uh, or subsea standards where you you can't uh, perforate the annulus, but uh, for some instrumentations you, you need to do that. Th there are some conflicts. What we've decided uh, to use the NORSOC standards for is if there are uh, things that won't be implemented internationally, we will put it in a NORSOC standard. For instance, trolling protection, uh, lifetime extension is a requirement in Norway so we will put that in a North Oak standard. Or if there are things we have the experience with here, we feel that need to go into the standards, but we know it takes five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years for an ISO or an API to be updated, uh, then we will put it in a North Oak, prepare it for uh, uh, transformation to uh, an international standard. I'm not sure I, I answered your question. I know there are some conflicts which we need to, to deal with, but uh, the NORSOC shouldn't be in conflict with the international standards. It should be in addition. If there are conflicts, we should state it in the regulations that 
we're referring to either this or to that. 